Bibles, read our scripture reading. I believe in doing it the hard way, not looking at the front of your bulletin. We're reading Psalms 100, verses 4 and 5. Psalms 100, verses 4 and 5. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. May the Lord add his blessing to our reading. People love a God whom they know little about. How many say, oh, we love Jesus? Just don't tell me too much about him. We love to follow God. Just make sure that it's a fuzzy idea in the back of my mind and not the real God of the universe. There's something about this idea of faintly knowing God without really understanding who God is. There's something comforting about it. After all, we can have that stained glass window shaky voice and say that we are spiritual. We're just not religious. So that that gets us out of a lot of accountability. And we can say that we just absolutely appreciate the Ten Commandments even so much. We want them all over, and we don't want any monuments to the commandments torn down. Oh, we love them. And then somebody comes along, can you believe this, and messes up our lives by suggesting that all these lofty ideas might actually intersect our daily routine. Then we're... You know, we've quit preaching and we've gone to meddling because now we have to face the clarity of God's commandments versus the obtuse fuzziness of our own experience. And only God is clear. Make no mistake about it. Only the commandments are a true beacon that gives us direction. And only the mercy and grace and love of Jesus can empower us and motivate us to do what is right and what is congruent with the Ten Commandments. So having said all that, I'm trying to get you ready for where this topic is going to take us today. I have purposely created a euphemistic setting which by interpretation simply means I've veiled where we're headed and you don't see it yet. And I do that purposefully and purposely so that you will follow me to the inescapable conclusion that if you have anything to do with God, you will have everything to do with his will. And his will as expressed in his revealings, his revelations from Moses to our day. So that's really the question. Otherwise, if you're not willing to accept all of God's revealed will, then you are really unwilling to acknowledge God in your life. But I know that's not the case with all of you. You can hardly wait for me to tell you more about Jesus so that you will know how to walk the way that God has laid out for all of us. Amen? Yes. 
So, I want you to take your swords, and, you know, a soldier that doesn't use his equipment is kind of, uh, I don't know what we'd say, kind of crazy, I guess. Even Desmond Doss, he had equipment. He didn't have a rifle, but he had equipment. And he did a lot of good and won the Congressional Medal of Honor as a Seventh-day Adventist conscientious objector in the Army. So, anybody who comes to church and doesn't really get involved in sharpening their sword, well, they've missed a large portion of the blessing that God designs. So I'd like all of you to turn to Psalm 100. Psalm 100. A very famous psalm, Psalm 100, and you can see, of course, that on the front of the bulletin are the verses that I specifically chose, but I'm actually going to read the entire psalm. That's a long one, isn't it? Oh, I can tell that people have found it. I'm going to read all five verses. Then uh, first, number one, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lands. Everybody agrees with that. But then he starts contextualizing it. Serve the Lord with gladness. We still are struggling with this idea that if I can look more somber than you, then I'm on the road to glory, closer to glory than you are. And so we have all our little appropriate gestures and... And, you know, we have to nod appropriately and carry our Bible texts around and circle the church seven times. And, you know, we have all these little things that we do which aren't wrong in themselves and they open the door to wonderful ideas, but we've substituted ceremony for substance. And we don't all have to be the same. There are young people here today who are afraid, scared to death, to give their lives completely to Jesus because they think they might be like, you know, geezer me or somebody and be more staid and in a rocking chair and reading half the day. And they don't want that. But guess what, young person and older, you don't need that. Amen. What you need is to find Christ for yourself and let him work through your personality. You don't have to be like grandpa or grandma or auntie, or uncle, or cousin Harry. You can be you and be totally committed to Jesus. I just can't say that enough. I, you know, it makes me want to head back into the classroom. I just uh, want young people to know, and I've seen such joy in their hearts when they realize that they can be a Jesus person and still be themselves. Sanctified and refined, yes, but themselves. Well, anyway, serve the Lord with gladness, and then we really narrow it down. Come before his presence with singing. And when you look at the context of this chapter, it's flat out saying these great blessings, the greatest blessings, come when you go to church. Now, I, I know that sounds a little strong in today's politically correct world, but when you go to church, you do receive a blessing that you can't get sitting under that maple tree in some park somewhere. By the way, I'm not against sitting under a maple tree in a park, but too many people use it in place of worshiping with God's people from week to week. So anyway, it says, Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. Listen. The basis of true worship, thanksgiving, and praise is found in this fundamental thought. God created. We are but the creature. Think about that. God is the creator. We, well, let's just let David speak here. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. 
That understanding would save you from a thousand and one deceptions. It would help you to imbibe of the true humility that heaven offers. It would enable you to understand God's purposes more fully. Who is this God who wanted to have friends so badly that he created them? That's you. God created you. You always think of it in terms of my salvation and what can I do and so forth. But listen, God created you so that you could talk back to him. He created you because he loves you. And his love is not dependent on what your response is. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, regardless of what your response is going to be. And we love, John says in his epistles, because he first loved us. There is a first cause, as philosophers would say. It is God's love. And God's love permeates this world. You say, I sure don't see it much, preacher. I think you need to get out of the church walls. Well, wait a minute. God's love is permeating and saturating this planet, but few choose to breathe its atmosphere. Too few choose to ingest the love of God into their own hearts. But that does not tell anything negative about God. It simply is a commentary on the perversity of the human heart, which is desperately wicked. Well, anyway, it says in verse 4, enter into his gates. You just did. You went through the gates, as we speak, with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him. I I can tell already some of you are thinking, is he ever going to get over this thanksgiving thing? And how long is he going to belabor this? And it's not that big a deal, Pastor. Just not tamp it down. This praise, thanksgiving stuff, I'm cool. I don't get into all this. The only time I go giddy is when the Celtics win. So, so don't, you know, just, you know, the religion thing, you're supposed to be very quiet. Just be here. We are a funny people, a very funny culture. I was turning on the radio, listening to a news report, and they had the final of some big hockey thing. (laughs) To hear the announcer, well, I mean, he just became explosive. It was unbelievable as this, I guess it was an upset or something, and he just exploded, even on the radio. You could just practically see him floating in the air with excitement and uh, listening to it on the radio. And yet when it comes to religious things, we don't want to praise God too much and we don't want to be too overt in our response to God. But you know what really is the reason for that? It's because we don't know God. If we really knew who God was, even a little bit, our hearts would be overfilling with appreciation for what Jesus is doing. Not just what he's done, but what he is doing. The salvation made at great cost and reemphasized so clearly in some interesting episodes in our church history. You know, I feel like just sitting down and asking all of you to now bask in these scriptural thoughts. And after 25 and a half minutes, we will have our closing song and go home. That's what we really should do. But God in his mercy says, I know you haven't been spending time with me enough to have this innate sense of thanksgiving. And so I'm going to keep sending you more and more messages and revelations Until every avenue is exhausted in seeking to save how many? 
all. God so loved the world. His design is to save all of us. He has plenty of streets, plenty of parking, plenty of water, plenty of electricity, no taxes, and he could take us all. Isn't it too bad that most folks are too lazy and as we learned in Sabbath school this morning, too indolent to respond? That is tragic. God has promised that as we respond, we can bring many others with us. As the old spiritual says, get on board, little children. You know the next phrase? There's room for many a more. I should bring a quartet up here to sing it. Maybe I'll make uh, Maurice sing it. I know he'd know it. All right, Hebrews, the first chapter. We're going to go to Hebrews for this reason. We're going to now explore why people aren't more thankful. And we're also going to explore some of the great dangers of not being thankful. Hebrews, the first chapter. Hebrews, the first chapter. I think I'll read this one out of um, Old English, semi-Elizabethan. I'm going to use the New King James on this one. Um, but the Old King James would be great, too. God, who at various times, this is Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the... So how many times have you said, I wish I could have lived when Jesus was here. I could have heard him speak. I wish I could have heard Paul speak. I wish I could have watched Elijah do these incredible exploits that he did. I wish I could have heard Stephen's farewell speech in front of those mean bad guys there in about Acts the seventh chapter. I wish I could have heard all this. Well, I have news for you today. God has spoken to you just as clearly as any episode you can read about in the Bible. He's spoken to you through the prophets who wrote the Bible. He has spoken to you and I want you to think about this very seriously. God is speaking to you through the prophets. How dare we let these prophetic words drop in the sands of time. And then he says, in these last days, God has spoken by whom? What does it say? God has spoken through Jesus. So where are you going to go to learn about that? First and foremost, you're going to run to the Gospels, aren't you? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you're going to learn what Jesus tells us that flush out the skeletal understandings that you may have gotten from perusing the Old Testament. Although if we had time, we could show where the Old Testament is saturated with the Gospel as well. But anyway... How does Jesus speak? And right now, I'm plunging in to dangerous, turbulent waters. Stay with me. Stay with me. Revelation, the first chapter. We're going to find out how God speaks through his son, Jesus Christ. Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, the revelation or the revealing as we have learned so nicely in the last few nights, the revealing of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. You want to be a servant of Jesus? Then study the revelation of Jesus Christ. Study his revealed will. But I'm going to move quickly because we got started late. And no, we're not going to start, stop right at 12, but neither are we going to go till 12.30, so be comfortable. But we must move into this theme, because I'm dead serious about this. I'm not doing this because I'm a pastor. I'm doing it because the Lord laid this on my heart. These things, long before I became a pastor, I was in another discipline for years. So in Revelation... It says it's a revelation of Jesus Christ, Revelation 1.1. So how does that express itself? How 
might that revelation express itself. Revelation 12, 17. Revelation 12, 17. I know you've read these, but we're going to put a little different twist on it. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. By the way, this is all in the context of the last days. The dragon being Satan, of course, and the woman being the church. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. That is the remnant, those who live at the end of time. And I'll leave it with you to decide where we're living in our history. Who? Now, these are the people who still love Jesus. They keep the commandments and they have the what? The testimony or the witness or the revelation of Jesus. And they don't just have it in their lives. Here we go, our first big jump. They don't just have the revelation of Jesus in their lives. They belong to an organization that acknowledges the revelation of Jesus in a corporate manner. That is, Jesus has revealed himself in a way to lead a movement of destiny. And he's revealed himself so clearly in these last days that none need miss the way. And in fact, not just individually has he revealed himself, but through the testimony of Jesus. And what might that be? Oh, yes. Revelation 19.10. Revelation 19.10. You should already know where I'm headed. Revelation 19, verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. This is John the Revelator trying to worship an angel, a created being. But he said to me, that's the angel, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren and sisters who have the testimony of Jesus. There it is again. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the Spirit. Spirit of prophecy. Listen, in the last days, those who follow Jesus will not only have an individual encounter and close connection with God, but as a group, they will be markedly led by the testimony of the spirit of prophecy. Ah. <sighs> Maybe we better talk about what the spirit of prophecy is a minute. You notice I haven't read any Adventist literature? You notice I haven't quoted from recent authors? You'll notice I haven't had to have the fathers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church to demonstrate my point. And now I'm going to take you back to a book closely nestled by the book of Revelation. I want you to turn to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1 19 to 21, where we learn what the spirit of prophecy is. 2 Peter 1, 19. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. And if you look at the tense, that is the sense also of this, it is as we look at something more fully confirmed. And of course, you should rightfully ask me right now, almost to the point of interrupting me, well, pastor, What's he comparing this to? What's more fully confirmed? Well, I I don't have time. But let me just say that earlier in the chapter, it was talking about the transfiguration of Jesus when he was transfigured before three of his disciples' faces as if it was a miniature second coming. That's what Peter's talking about. But he says, we have something that is more confirming. Can you imagine that? More confirming than this miraculous experience with Jesus. It's like a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. It's a light that's ever growing. Knowing this verse, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. There you have it. 
The spirit of prophecy is the spirit of God working on holy men to write the sacred words that you read in what you call the Holy Bible. But then I have to remind myself, wait, that's the testimony of Jesus. And that's the prophetic gift. And if I go to over to Ephesians 4, Ephesians the fourth chapter, Ephesians the fourth chapter, I'm going to find something a little unsettling about this prophetic gift. Ephesians the fourth chapter, Ephesians the fourth chapter, I'm going to read this in a modern paraphrase, because you all know the themes already, and which will give you new ideas about Ephesians 4. This is from the Message Bible. Uh, I'm starting in verse 1. In light of all this, here's what I want you to do. While I'm locked up here, a prisoner for the master, I want you to get out there and walk, better yet, run on the road God called you to travel. That's Ephesians 4.1 in the Message Bible. And I personally, this isn't gospel, but I personally think Paul would talk almost more like that uh, than anything. He was a very open, blunt, but kind speaker who just laid it out. And he says, listen, you've got to know how to get out and run on the road God has called you to travel. You've got to get going on it, he says. And you know what the rest of the chapter is about? Spiritual gifts, including the gift of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy. And he goes on to say, you're going to have it until, well, this one doesn't have verses, but it talks about being fully matured. Uh, being fully matured and growing up into Christ. In other words, we're going to have the gift of prophecy till Jesus comes again. Now, having said that, I'm not going to belabor. I could give you lots of teaching to accentuate the scriptural background. But today being our last Sabbath, before our visitors start coming, I'm going to just lay it out. If we are really going to lead these precious souls into a saving relationship with Jesus and appreciation of God's great work and, a des and motivate them to desire to join our church, we ourselves must be open to all that God has revealed. We ourselves must be in relationship to the spirit of prophecy. We can't jawbone about whether or not Ellen White is appropriate. We're not going to be talking Ellen White to these people for quite a while. That's not the point. The point is, if you're clear on the relationship your relationship to the prophetic gift, it will naturally ooze out in everything you say and do for these precious souls that come through those doors. Amen. You don't need to mention Ellen White. You don't need to quote verbiage, long verbiage from her. What you need to do is be clear in your own mind that you're open to that further revelation that accentuates and accents the, the Bible, that you are open to it in your own personal experience. And that you spent time with this relevant gift of the spirit of prophecy for our days. Because the truth is, I've just been reperusing this. In volume five of the testimonies, it's very clear that we read Ellen White to see the centrality of the scriptures more fully. And thus, Ellen White functions decidedly different from any other modern prophet that has claimed any kind of prophetic gift. Decidedly different. And with you must be clear on that. And I'm going to go a little bit uh, extra, but you have to go home with something today. You have to. Because if you're not clear, 
our work and what Pastor Dakota is doing is going to be, at least to an extent, neutralized. Because we're not clear about the advanced principles of the spirit of prophecy. So I'm going to ask the young people to come up here, and I know I have a lot of them today. So the first thing I'm going to give out, come on, Caleb, you lead the way. I'm going to show you very quickly what kind of a person Ellen White was in relation to her own children. I don't think you'll have to be by yourself. Come on, kids, we need more. Come on, Trent. Uh, you can stand up here a minute. Yeah, it, you won't get tired. Listen. Um, how can I say this? Those of you who studied uh, history and, and literature know that the 19th century was very formal. So with that in mind, you'll see this letter I'm about to give you as unbelievably refreshing. It's a personal letter, boys, written December 24, 1857, from Volney, Iowa. And it's written by Ellen White to her kitties. And you know what? I think at that time, they were probably younger than you, for sure. And they might have been younger even than you guys. And everybody here is going to get that letter. So I want you to get that letter out just to everybody as quickly as you can. And, and I gave you too many. Let's get some more people handing these out, Trent, so we can, uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, who else can I get to help me hand out? Maybe even somebody a little older. Oh, yes, I haven't taken it. Okay, there, okay. Okay, I think we find, yeah, we're good, but I have more, so come up, Dakota, and help. Thank you. All right, now, you're all going to have this rare letter, and um, I'm going to be giving you two more things, so just hold on. This letter, now you're going to learn something from history, comes from this book. And I know you've never seen it, because it was printed in 1864, and I have the original. One of the originals. This is not somebody's copy. See, I, I like to get to the source. <laughs> So anyway, and I taught at an institution that had their own bindery, and they fixed up the, the, the uh, binding, and now I have this 1864 volume. Please keep raising your hands. The guys will, um, please keep raising your hands. Did everybody get one? I guess, thank you. Thank you so much. Did you get one? Oh, you better, okay, mate. It's just like a letter from Grandma. Okay. Now, I want you all to just look at this very quickly. Dear children, here we are, 12 miles from Walk-On. Thank you, thank you. And I'm not going to go through it, but she says in the second paragraph, children strive to do right and love the Lord. Obey those who have care for you. See, Ellen White had to be away from her children here and there. And uh, be kind to each other. It's such great. You should be thankful for your comfortable home. We often suffer with cold on account of unfinished op and open houses. They slept, she went on to say, in a house, and she and James were staring there sleeping. They saw the stars. There was a big hole in the roof where the pipe was supposed to go through. Ah, And then she goes on, I hope, dear Henry, that you are a good boy and are happy in doing right. Continue to strive to be faithful. And then she goes on to say how much she wants her kitties in heaven. And then she ends up, dear children, seek for this. That is this higher experience. Pray for it. Live for it. Your affectionate mother. Listen, this is unbelievable for 19th century writing. I just can't emphasize it enough. Now I have to tell you the rest of the story. This letter is in this little book. And this little book was printed for a funeral. And the funeral was for that precious boy that I just read to you, Henry. At 16 years of age, he got one of those funny diseases of that time. And before they knew enough about health reform and everything, and he was stricken and then died. And this whole book, is a recording, it really is, is a bulletin of the funeral service. 
You know who spoke? Uriah Smith. And it is a powerful, powerful testimony. Well, that's just to give you a little idea about her. Now, the next thing I'm going to give you is from a book that is written on the life of Christ that will bring zeal to your soul if you'll just spend time in it. It's called The Desire of Ages. So if I can have my uh, great helpers to come up here and uh, we will get these out as quickly as we can. Uh, let me get a few more. I want to split these up. And thank you so much. And this is from a book that some have considered, it's been said that even the Library of Congress, they think it's uh, somebody there thought it was the best book on the life of Christ. I'm, but be that as it may, you need to look at how Jesus is described. To say nothing of the events uh, that are described. So how are we doing? You need some more? Here, let me give you a bunch more. And uh, just go back there. I want everybody to have it. So you all read it very quickly. We're not going to read through it. Don't worry. But I am going to pick and choose. This is 668 of Desire of Ages. Listen to this. The Lord is disappointed when his people place a low estimate upon themselves. And then she goes on to give the antidote for those who have low self-esteem. You need to read it really close. And the next paragraph, but to pray in Christ's name means what? Much. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This is what it means. I'm not even going to tell you what it means. You're going to read it. It's incredible. Incredible. And then the next paragraph. All true obedience comes from the heart. And then she describes a conversion experience that you won't believe. You know, church and everything, I, I enjoyed, I guess, going. But you know, I'd come here and sit. Let's see, what are we going to sing today? Thanks. You know what? The summer that I was 15 years of age and I got into the spirit of prophecy like I never had before, all of a sudden the hymnal became a new book. The words leaped out in front of my visual perceptors and I was stunned. That can happen to you, young person. Listen to the next paragraph. As Christ lived the law in humanity, so we may do if we will take hold of the strong for strength. And then you know what she goes on to say? Young people should love this. You know what she says? I'll put it in a nutshell. Be independent. No, we're not talking about false independence. We're not talking about rebelliousness. <coughs> we're talking about ascertaining God's will for our lives. Amen. And she says, you don't need to ask Grandma and Grandpa and Uncle Harry and Aunt Sue and everybody else. You need to take counsel. You need to ponder everything they say. But God will teach you yourself. Amen. Has God taught you lately? Amen. Taught you. By the way, you old folks over 18 and a half, you can be taught the same way. Then the, in the, right toward the bottom, power for obedience for service will be imparted to them. Don't you want power for obedience? Ah. Oh. Well, this is again my last opportunity and this is my last handout. But I'm going to give you the full fire hydrant approach. I'm going to share with you something that is very meaningful, very direct, very frank, but also needed. And I'm going to be taking from a couple pages in volume five of the testimonies. And I'd like to have my uh, wonderful volunteers come up really quickly. And we're going to get this out. And we're going to peruse it in very short order. And I mean short order. There you go. And uh, I am just... So thankful. And as soon as you all, I have most of you have this, then I'm going to share a couple of things from it. 
And I know you're going to appreciate this. By the way, the word testimonies is often used as a cover word for the writings of Ellen White. So I kind of want you to know, you need some more? I I, kind of want you to know that so that uh, you can kind of, it's not just the volumes called Testimonies for the Church. Okay, does everybody have one or most everybody? Ten, you can, don't, you don't have to share if you're a family. You can each have one. Uh, That is of anyone who will read it, seriously. All right, how are we doing? Did we get everything out? Thank you, man. I I think uh, it's Abby, right? (laughs) Abby has a few left. So if anybody else, uh, all right. It's so great to have uh, Abby here helping us out. We, we, uh, as well as everyone, and Trent and Caleb, our good friend from way up north in Centerville. Okay. It is Satan's plan to weaken the faith of God's people and what? Satan knows how to make the attack. And what he does is he makes people question leadership and then they question the testimonies and then they question the Bible. And there's more that can be said about that. And they head for big trouble. Next paragraph. A testimony for certain young men published in 1880 speaks as follows. They were skeptical. They encouraged questionings and doubt. They, and they did this for this reason. Listen to this. Because they are ignorant of the spirit and power and force of the testimonies. This is why I'm giving you some things to read. There is power in reading the testimonies. There really is. I was shown that many had so little spirituality that they did not understand the value of the testimonies or their real object. See, I want you to understand this before these precious souls come in. You're not going to be blurting this out to them, but you're going to understand it. So you can be a safe leader. And they've been given by God for the benefit of his people, top of 673, and some of these folks pass judgment. It's very sad. There are some in blank, we could say Arkansas, that'll be general enough. There are some in Arkansas who have never fully submitted to reproof. And going down a little farther, the influence of these persons upon individuals who come here and are brought in contact with them is very bad. The influence, now here's the sentence. They fill the minds of these, what what is it? Newcomers with questionings and doubts in regard to the testimonies of the Spirit of God. Pray God that you not be one of them, right? But that you be one who encourages belief in Jesus. Oh. What a foretaste of glory divine. Blessed assurance, Jesus truly is mine. And so while we're thinking here, come on up, Maurice, and our closing song, what did I give here? Rejoice ye pure in heart. And that's because, number 27, that is because we want to be truly pure in heart. Pure for Jesus. This isn't just talking about sexual impropriety. This is talking about a heart that accepts the pure word in its fullness, which would include the spirit of prophecy in our day. Amen? So now you're going to sing this with real meaning, and we're going to sing it at an up-tempo, and we'll sing all five stanzas, and it'll probably only take a minute and 40 seconds. Con- the congregation kindly stand as we enthusiastically sing hymn 27 Rejoice ye pure in heart Rejoice ye pure in heart Rejoice give thanks and sing 
your festival banner wave on high the cross of Christ your King Amen Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice Rejoice, give thanks and sing with voice as full and strong as ocean searching praise Send forth the sturdy hymns of all the psalms of ancient days. Rejoice, 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 give thanks and sing. With all the angels' choirs, with all the saints on earth, Pour out the strains of joy and bliss, the rapture no burst birth. Rejoice, 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 give thanks and sing. Yes, on through life's long path, still chanting as ye go. From you to age by night and day, in gladness and in woe. Rejoice, 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 give thanks. And last stanza, praise him who reigns on high, the Lord whom we adore. The Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, one God forever. Bring it home, church. Rejoice, 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 give thanks and sing. Amen. Do you believe it? Amen. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the revelation of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.